I mean, as my thoughts here. I know they're all really jamming out. All righty. So welcome. My name is Maddie Louder, and I am the current Miss Washington. I was given this job back in July um, of 2021, and then I will become our next Miss Washington in July of 2022. So this July, I have about four more months left. Um, but I'm here to talk to you all today about eating disorders and body image. This mask is going to give me a run for my money today. Um, so just a little bit about me. I graduated from Oklahoma City University, and I was also in Greek life there as well. So I know how much this issue impacts um, our communities on campus and in our generation as well. I graduated with my degree in psychology, and then I plan on pursuing my doctoral degree in counseling psychology, hopefully to enroll this fall. Um, my goal is to go to Northwest University. I just had a two-hour interview the other day. Those things are no joke, grad school interviews, my goodness. Um, but I also love hiking. So this is just me on a hike and I always bring my camera with me. I'm a photographer and I actually have my own photography business on the side. It's really, really important for me. I know so often we look at photos and be like, oh, I don't look good in that photo. But because of my background, it's really important for me to just make people feel loved um, and also bring appreciation for their bodies as I'm taking their photos. So that's one of my biggest passions right there. I grew up a dancer, so I started dancing when I was three years old, and this is actually me dancing on the Miss Washington stage this last summer, um, so that was a dance that I did. I'm a dog mom. This is my dog, Otis. Everyone say, oh, hi, Otis. Um, and then lastly, a picture up at the top there, that's me being crowned Miss Washington. Uh, prior to being Miss Washington, I was Miss Emerald City in the Miss America organization, and after I had earned the title of Miss Emerald City, I went on to compete for Miss Washington. First try, I gave it all I got, and then here I am today. So that's just a little bit about me. And then we're going to jump into um, just talking about body image and eating disorders after, well, I forgot the slide was here, after I talk about what I do at Miss Washington. So I am a representative of Miss Washington Scholarship Organization, and this organization provides scholarship dollars for young women all across the state of Washington. And then also, if you do win the title of Miss Washington, you compete at Miss America. So Miss America has been around for 100 years, providing scholarship dollars for women so that they can advance their career goals as well as further their education. And all of those things come with scholarship money. So I've actually earned $35,000 in scholarship to help pay for my education through competing. But I've also gained immeasurable things like interview skills, public speaking skills, the ability to network so well with other individuals, and also just networking from the get-go when you partner with nonprofits, community organizations, and being able to speak on behalf of those organizations as well. I've also gained um, confidence like no one's business, and I've also lastly gained friendships that are going to last a lifetime past the stage, past being Miss Washington, past when my crown over here gets all tarnished and old. So all of those things bring me so much joy, but these are just a couple of the things that I get to do across the state, and this actually hasn't been updated since August, so these are all the things that I did in the month of July up until August, but over here on this side, this is one of the girls, little girls that I mentor. Her name's Addie, and Addie has been my mentee for the past five years now. I started mentoring her when she was, oh, I think like five, six years old, and now she's going into middle school and going to seventh grade, which is so crazy to think about. I've also partnered with Chambers of Commerce all across the state. So this is me at the Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce up there at one of their networking events this past August. I've spoken with the Girl Scouts of Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho, as well as the Girl Scouts of Western Washington. I do a lot of public speaking. That's probably like 90% of my job is public speaking with a microphone in my hand. I do also get the opportunity to speak to schools all across Washington, even though COVID is still here, hopefully it should be gone soon. I did all that I could to be able to impact the students that I come in contact with. And I talk to them about mental health, being mindful, being kind to one another, anti-bullying, body image, just like we're talking about today. And I speak to students from the ages of five all the way up to adults like you all. I also get to go to cool events. This is at the Sunflower Festival in Snohomish County, and they were able to just invite me and be a part of it. That little lady right there is 103 years old, and I thought she decided to be Miss Washington for the day, so I gave her my sash, and that it was the joyous, most joyous smile I think I've ever seen in my life, and I did that for her. Um, I do a lot of volunteering at 
community food banks because food insecurity so often is linked to eating disorders and body image issues as well. And then I also get to attend fundraising events. This was the Brothers and Cadillac Celebrity Stakeout, where I was one of those celebrity servers with a lot of other celebrity servers. So I got to meet a lot of um, past Seahawks players, as well as local um, celebrities in the Seattle area. So that was really, really fun and cool. So it's not just a crown and a sash. You're really active in your community. You're partnering with nonprofit organizations. You're really getting down in the, the woodwork of all that you can do within the state so you can impact as many people as possible. All right, so I'm going to have you all close your eyes real quick. Then we're going to do a little activity. So all my friends on the Zoom at home, feel free to also close your eyes and maybe just lift a finger, lift a hand, or if you just want to acknowledge what I'm saying. Um, and if I read a statement that you resonate with, I just want you to put your right hand up in the air. Raise your hand if you have ever looked in the mirror and thought something negatively about your body. Great, you can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you have ever scrolled through your Instagram and compared your body to someone else's. Awesome, you can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you have ever looked up a diet on the internet. You can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you've ever been on a diet. You can put your hand up. Raise your hand if you've ever gone on a juice cleanse. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you've ever counted calories. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever cut out a food group or restricted certain foods you don't have an allergy to. You can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you ever went to the gym to quote, burn off calories that you have consumed prior in the day. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever made yourself throw up because of something you ate. You can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you have ever made a negative comment about someone else's body shape or size. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever been called too fat. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever been called too thin or skinny. You can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you have ever said you are, quote, saving your calories for a meal later in the day. You can put your hands down. And raise your hand if you don't believe you are good enough. You can put your hands down. And you can go ahead and open your eyes. To take my mask off for a moment to breathe whenever his eyes were closed, who <laughs> could do that? Um, so at one point, everyone in this room raised their hand for one of those comments. And I'm not sure at home if any of those have resonated with you as well, but it's a really big deal that a lot of these are normalized in our society. And so we're going to talk about that today and see how we might be able to change some of these thoughts, some of these actions and behaviors to really create more inclusive body shapes and sizes in our society today. I do want to preface going into eating disorder awareness and talking about body image. I know some of these topics can be really triggering, especially in Greek life, especially with women, um, if we have also gone through similar things. And because of that, it is totally okay at any point if you just want to be done for the day, log off Zoom, or just step out of the room, feel free. That is okay by me. Um, I do have a profession in the field of eating disorders. And I do have my own background with my own experience. So I will say that I try to prevent from using any triggering comments, using numbers or any demographics that are going to be impactful in a negative way. But if you do need to step up, I'm not offended at all. By them. So jumping into my story, like I mentioned, I do have personal experience with an eating disorder. So when I was 17 years old, I was a dancer and I grew up my entire life dancing. Um, I wanted to make it to Broadway. I wanted to be a Radio City Rock Hat. I really wanted to make it big in the dance world. I never really thought negatively about my body until a dance school that I auditioned for told me that I would never be good enough unless I lost a certain amount of weight. And that comment really impacted me in a negative way for a really long time in my life. And I did what I thought I needed to do. Being the person I am, I just wanted to prove them wrong. And so, you know what? I am good enough. I can be a dancer, and I'm going to prove to you that I can be the size that you want me to be. So I lost the weight, but in the process of that, I also lost who I was as a person. 
it became all consuming and it did turn into anorexia nervosa where I was starving my body and not giving myself enough intake to be able to support myself throughout the day. I would also overcompensate by exercising endless, endless hours in a day after I had already been to so many dance classes in a day. And that, at that point, was just diminishing my body shape and size. It broke up so many friendships and relationships in my life, and it even in impacted my relationship that I had with my own siblings and my family. And because of that, today I stand here fully recovered because I realized that, you know what, it doesn't matter what my body shape and size is. It matters the impact that I have on other people and the ability to engage with the people in my life fully. So I decided to seek help. I decided to find a therapist and a dietitian to support me along our recovery journey. And after three years of struggling with an eating disorder, I found a full recovery from my eating disorder. Today, I now work as an eating disorder professional at an eating disorder recovery center in Seattle, where I'm able every single day to help others recover from their own battles with their eating disorders and also be able to speak publicly about the signs and symptoms of eating disorders. So if you do recognize these in your friends or family members, you're able to take action and get them the help that they need. Or if you even see it within yourself, you're able to get yourself the help that you need as well. So with that, here's a couple facts about eating disorders that I think it's very important to know. Eating disorders are the most fatal mental illness in the United States today and it affects 30 million Americans every single year. And these are only the ones that come forward and say, hey, I'm sick, I'm not doing okay. These are not mentioning the ones that are too afraid to come forward and say, I'm sick, I need help. It's also a fact that eating disorders are a mental illness. They impact the body physically as well as mentally. So even though they are a mental illness, we do have physical effects on the body that can really, really deteriorate your overall health. And then lastly, it's a fact that knowing those signs and symptoms can help change lives, even if that life is yours. So going into those signs and symptoms of eating disorders, I wanna start with our three main types of eating disorders. That first one being anorexia nervosa. I think that this is the one that people think about the most when they think about eating disorders, and it comes into the category of just not eating, but it's a little bit more deep than that. So anorexia nervosa, is identified by an extreme restriction of caloric intake, often associated with a fear of gaining weight, poor body image, extreme weight loss, and the thought of being fat, even though they're potentially underweight. But I wanna put a little asterisk here, because oftentimes those with anorexia nervosa are not actually underweight. And that's one of the faults in the DSM-5, which is the uh, manual that helps diagnose eating disorders and other mental disorders is that underweight is in the category of anorexia nervosa. But you do not have to be underweight to be struggling with this mental illness. Some signs that you might see in your friends or your family members are that you might dress in warm layers to keep warm. When you're at a lower body weight, sometimes our body has to overcompensate. And so therefore you might wanna put on extra layers to keep your body temperature at a reasonable temperature so that you're staying warm. You also might experience refusal to eat certain foods or labeling foods as good or bad, um, kind of restricting and dwindling out which foods you choose to eat. You might experience a loss of energy because you're not fully fueling your body in a way that's gonna be beneficial to engaging fully in your life. And you also might need uh, express a need to burn off, quote unquote, burn off calories or food that you ate during that day. With anorexia nervosa, oftentimes there's a really strong need for control or controlling the food that you eat, but that's not also specific just to this mental disorder. It's also specific to a lot of other mental disorders. You might also experience social withdrawal, especially in situations where there's food present or where you're going to be engaging in food in a social setting. As I mentioned earlier, eating disorders are not just a mental disorder, but they're also a physical disorder. So some signs that you might see physically in the body, you might see a preoccupation in, with food in your brain, or you might notice fatigue, headaches, mood swings, lots of irregular hormonal changes in the brain that cause for different mood disorders. You might also notice that your hair is falling out or your nails are really brittle and break easily. You might have poor circulation of blood, so your heart might have an irregular heartbeat to it. You might have different GI symptoms. So your stomach might be in knots sometimes and it might hurt when you actually try to eat. And then bones might start to weaken or break 
It may become really brittle, just like your nails and your hair too. Our second main three, the big three eating disorders here, our third one, our second one is bulimia nervosa. And this one is identified by recurrent binge eating episodes complemented by compensatory binge episodes, such as over-exercising or purging. So there's a sense to try to get rid of the food that you just ate. Some signs that you might see behaviorally with bulimia nervosa are attitudes about late weight loss and dieting as the primary concern or focus of your day-to-day -day life. You might notice that your friends or family members disappear really quickly after eating. You also might notice that individuals that you know are hoarding food in strange places. You might notice that there's swelling in the jaw or tooth decay. Any um, signs in the mouth that there are different changes because of the purging behaviors. And you also might notice extreme mood swings as well, just similar to anorexia nervosa. A lot of the times extreme mood swings are a really telltale sign of any mental disorder, not just eating disorders, because those mood swings are a sign that something hormonally is changing in the body. And then lastly, there might be frequent mirror checking or perceived flaws in your body that aren't actually there. So a little bit of body dysmorphia. On the left-hand side over there, there are just some other examples of what might show up in signs of bulimia nervosa. And a lot of the physical symptoms in the body are very similar to anorexia nervosa. Our third of the big three eating disorders that we see is binge eating disorder. And this one is actually becoming one of the more prevalent eating disorders that we see today. Some people associate it with emotionally overeating, but it is diagnosable as well. And binge eating disorder is identified by recurrent binge eating episodes. And a binge eating episode can be described as eating a large quantity of food, way larger than what you would normally eat at a meal, and in a really short constricted period of time. And this oftentimes feels uh, associated to a lack of control or an inability to stop. So things that you might notice with friends or family members are empty wrappers in the trash can or they're trying to hide food from you, withdrawal from friends and social situations. They also might be developing food rituals about when they can eat or when they can't eat. They might notice or you might notice fluctuations in weight, you might notice low self-esteem, um, and you also might notice that they have feelings of shame, guilt, or disgust after eating a meal. Some physical signs in the body might be weight gain, fatigue. You might also see low self-esteem and low mood. That includes depressive behaviors as well. You might notice that there is high blood pressure, high cholesterol in uh, physical signs, as well as um, different signs of other health complications that have GI symptoms, so in the stomach. All right, so those are our big three eating disorders. I promise it gets more engaging and fun. This is just the educational piece of it. Our last one I want to talk today about is orthorexia. And orthorexia oftentimes is perceived in the world of diet culture as clean eating. So it's the obsession with only eating foods that are deemed clean or healthy by our society. Um, and oftentimes those who have orthorexia become really anxious around processed foods or hold rigid food rules around processed foods versus organic foods. So they really put labels on their foods and it also brings anxiety coming up around foods that are not within their clean eating group of foods. So what you might see is that they have a preoccupation with eating habits labeling foods as good and bad. They may also not be willing to eat foods that are labeled in their bad category. There's extreme food rules and rigidity around it. Exchange changes in mood or emotional distress around food that does not fit their categories. And it really impacts social interactions, especially when there is food present. You might notice worsening depression, uh, mood swings, panic attacks, generalized anxiety disorder, severe weight loss, malnutrition, and then multitude of other health complications that come around with malnutrition. All right, so what does normal look like? Now that we see all of those eating disorders, what does a normal eating habit look like? So normal eating to fuel your body. So we have our normal category over here and then our disordered category over here if you're looking at that chart. So normal, 
you're going to eat to fuel your body. Our body needs energy to go, just like you put fuel in a car to make it drive. Our body needs food in order to function. A disordered look at this is working out to eat, so compensating for the food that you put in your body. Normal behaviors means like eating three meals a day, snacks as needed throughout the day. A disorder might be skipping meals or forgetting to eat, eating small snacks in place of a full meal. Normal might be eating every three to four hours while awake, which is pretty normal. It's about when your stomach says, hey, I'm hungry again. Disordered eating would be going as long as possible without eating. Normal eating is eating a variety of foods from all the food groups. Disordered would be eliminating entire food groups. Normal would be eating wholesome carbohydrate rich foods as part of adequate meal sizes. Disordered might be only eating those carbohydrate rich foods in small stock portions or restricting that food group completely. I'm gonna skip down here to movement. So normal movement means listening to your body and being able to uh, determine what is good pain and what is bad pain and knowing when to take a day off when you are experiencing um, pain or issues with your muscles or joints. Disordered would be compelled to exercise despite the situation that you're in. So if you have an injury, still pushing through, or if you are sick, still pushing through. Normal movement would be moving your body to improve performance or feel good. Disordered would be there's an underlying motivation to exercise, such as weight loss or trying to maintain a body shape and size. Normal movement would be accepting and working with your natural body size and shape your limitations that every single body has. Disordered would be trying to change your body's natural shape or pushing past those limitations that you have. And then lastly, normal would be that you're happy with your accomplishments and your personal best that you are able to do when you're moving. Say that you're able to do a full chaturanga at yoga class today and you're really proud of that. Or maybe you're not able to do it next time. That's totally okay too. Just being okay with whatever comes about with your movement. Disorder means that you're never satisfied with your fitness level and you're always striving and striving for the next, next thing or the next best thing. When we're looking at a cycle of dieting, and this is why I oftentimes say dieting is a risk factor for developing an eating disorder. This cycle will keep on going and going and going until we break the cycle. So first, you might feel a needing to get into control by dieting or restricting. And that might mean that stress is coming up in your life or you have a stressor and that's your stress response is try to get into control by controlling your food. You lead into a diet or restriction cycle and then you're feeling, oh yeah, I got this. I'm good. Everything's great. Life is in control. That leads to physical or emotional needs and an inability to, to continue that restriction, which leads to binging and overeating, and then those feelings of guilt or remorse. And I know I have definitely experienced this, this in my lifetime before, and I'm sure some of you in the room have also experienced a similar cycle to this, but it just keeps going around and around that circle until we can really accept our bodies for the shape and size they are and for who we are as a person. The reason also, I'm gonna go back to that prior slide here, that I talked about movement along with eating is because eating disorders aren't just about the food, it's also about our body as a whole. So when we're moving our body, that also impacts our body image as well. Are there any athletes in the room at all? Yeah. So athlete, athletics especially, there's times that there's higher prevalence rates of eating disorders in athletic communities for that specific reason of performance. All right, so if you are struggling with any of these things, if you have experienced any of these things in your lifetime, I just want you to know that your feelings are completely valid. You're allowed to feel these things, you're allowed to experience these things, but it's also important that you're also allowed to seek help. So please, please, if you are struggling or you know someone who's struggling, find the help that they need, find the help that you need, so that you're able to live a full life. Okay, so now what? But what do I do with all this information? That was a lot of information about eating disorders. What do I do to take the next steps forward and get the help that I need, or maybe help someone else find the help that they need? So what do I do if a friend approaches me? First, be aware that you are not a mental health professional, you're not a medical professional, and just acknowledge that. It's okay not to know everything. It's okay just to be the friend that is listening. If someone approaches you, speak kindly and with concern. Try not to minimize their struggles. Oftentimes I tell people to listen more and talk less because if they're coming to you and willing to speak to you about their struggles, 
then you are the friend that they trust enough to tell that to. And then lastly, as you are talking to a friend, sometimes you're just planting the seed. Hey, have you ever thought about seeking counseling or seeking treatment? And maybe they're not ready for it in that moment. But here's the thing, oftentimes when you're going into eating disorder treatment, or if you are going into mental health treatment of any sort, you have to want that treatment. So if they're not ready to go to treatment, that's okay. But your job is just to plant the seed and listen to them. Let's flip it. So what if I'm the one that's struggling? First, there's a lot of great resource out, resources out there just to read up on it and see if you do have an eating disorder. Um, so the online screening tool through the National Eating Disorders Association, which is NEDA, um, you can go to nationaleatingdisorders.org and it's right at the top of their webpage. So if you do want to use that as a tool just to check in on yourself and see what behaviors you may be exhibiting, that's a great tool to go to and use online. You also should really find someone that you trust and can in. At least one person in your life. I know we all have our sorority sisters, but one person in your life that we can go to to talk to. And then look up options for help. And that might be going to that one friend that you can talk to. And then also being able to say, hey, I need you to sit with me while I look up treatment centers. Or, hey, I want you to sit with me while I look up therapists. To make sure that you have that support that you need. And if there is no shame in getting help, there is no shame in finding treatment. It's actually such a good thing for yourself to do because you are getting the help that you need. And you're also being able to take that courage and that step forward to continue living your life fully. Where do eating disorders even start? So we have three main focuses here. And if you've ever taken a basic psychology class, you've probably already learned this, but we're gonna break it down as it pertains. You're nodding your head over there, yeah. Um, so you probably already learned this in the basic psychology 101 course, but we're gonna break it down specifically for eating disorders. So first we have that biological one. What does biology mean? Who shot it out? The study of life. The study of life, <laughs> yes. So biology comes down to life, our genetics. Do we have a predisposition to having an eating disorder? Oftentimes, if we do have someone in our family who has an eating disorder or who has had an eating disorder in the past, we're more likely to be predisposed to having an eating disorder as well. So there is a genetic link there, and it comes down to that genetic link in the biological sphere. In psychological, that's the environment that we're placed in and our mind. So when we're talking about emotional resiliency, do we have the coping strategies that when a stressor comes up in our life, we're able to cope with it in a healthy way rather than restricting our caloric intake or turning to binge eating? Do we have that emotional re resiliency, how we built those coping skills in the psychological sphere? And for eating disorders specifically, I have a feeling that it relies a lot on the social sphere, which we're gonna dive deeper into that social sphere here in a moment. But that social sphere comes down to the environment that we're in physically. So when we look at campus, we're in Greek life in here. Um, we also might be surrounded by a lot of women who are all beautiful and intelligent and smart, and that might lead to a lot of comparison. We also live in a world where there's actors and actresses who are so good looking, we have movies out there that we're looking at. We have all those diet ads that we see on the internet, lose weight fast, X, Y, and Z. We see them all the time. And those social media influencers don't help either. So those social spheres that we're sitting in all the time where we physically intake information, um, they impact our ability to develop an eating disorder as well. So we have these three categories, biological, are looking at our genetics and our biological makeup. Psychological, we're looking at that emotional resiliency. And then social, the environment we're physically in, the information that we input into our brain. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into that social aspect here, exploring body image. Where do our body image issues even come from? Where do they start? Okay, so we got some good looking people up here. Try to pick up a variety of photos here that I found on the internet. But what do we notice about these photos? You can just think it in your brain for a moment. We're going to make a list, a little audience participation in a moment. All right, so let's go ahead and do that right now. Let's make a list. What makes the perfect man and perfect woman? We're going to start over here. We're going to do pink house. I'm going to put the microphone down so I can type here. But you can just shout them out. What is the ideal for a female? <clears throat> Probably having like clear skin. Clear skin. 
Great, what else? My friends on Zoom, if you wanna type it in the chat, if you wanna contribute, that would be fabulous. Anna's gonna watch the chat box. Lots of makeup. Makeup. What else? Hourglass. Hourglass, great. Blonde. Tall. Tall. Jawline. Jawline. <laughs> that could be woman or man. Yeah, for sure. I thought it would be too. Jawline might be one word, you know. I graduated college and I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> what else? Reserved. Reserved. The behavior of quiet, not should be seen, not heard. How about my Zoom friends at home? Do you have any ones that you want to contribute? You guys are more than welcome to unmute and shout it out too. I think we're missing <laughs> a chat box. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> I feel like big booty is the one that you see that is. Big booty, small waist. Any others? All right, let's jump over to men. What's the ideal male? Muscular. story about this. I did this at a middle school once. I'm going to think it's super interesting. <laughs> I'll share it at the end when this is not recording. <laughs> what else? A dominant. Dominant. Breadwinner. Breadwinner. Out of shoulders. Is it good? Maybe one more. Or two more. Whatever we got. Veins. Oh, yeah. What did you say? I said veins. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a pretty good list. Awesome. All right. So we've got on our female, female side, we've got clear skin, makeup, hourglass, blonde, tall, jawline, reserve, big booty, small waist. Our male, jawline, muscular, tall, athletic, dominant, tough, breadwinner, broad shoulders, nice hair, and veins. Where does this come from? I like to call this the appearance ideal because this is what society says is acceptable to be in our society. And it's it's funny because all of these society me societal messages where we get in our brain that, oh, we have to be tall, we have to be thin, we have to have a good jawline, men have to be muscular, men have to be tough. These are all messages we hear in our society, but they're changing constantly across cultures. Do you think that the same beauty standards that we have in America are the same as someone who maybe lives in Japan? No, or Africa or Europe. It's all different across cultures and it depends on cultural beliefs as well. Also across time, if we were still wearing things that we wore in the 1800s, I think people might look at us a little strange, right? Fashion changes over time. Beauty standards change across time as well. And then across genders, it changes from male to female and everything in between. So really when we're trying to chase these standards, we're chasing something that's constantly moving and constantly moving forward that we're never really gonna reach that appearance ideal. So I have a few questions for you. Where do you think the appearance ideal comes from? We can shout these out as well. TV. TV. Social media is a big one nowadays. TikTok, Instagram. Parents, yes, at home. Has anyone's parent ever made a comment about their body to them or even an indirect comment my mom used to say things about her body in the mirror all the time, and that impacted me as a small child. Where else do you think it comes from? Is 
Do we have friends or peer pressure? Friends, peer pressure, or even the friend circles that we surround ourselves with and how they look. That can be an indirect form of pressure. What else? The activities we do. Mm -hmm. Specifically like athletics, being in athletic organizations, sometimes there's an ideal body shape or size in order to perform best. Medical professionals. Medical professionals, that's a big one, yes. Awesome. So these are some of the lists that I came up with. So family and friends, definitely, those impacting comments that they say, or even just the body shapes and sizes of our family and friends, how that impacts our view of our own body. Because sometimes that comparison creeps in, especially in friend groups, especially in friend groups of a similar age or demographic. Social media is huge right now. I know pretty much everyone in here raised their hand if they said, I scrolled through social media and I've compared myself to someone else on social media. And social media influencers don't really help, especially if they're promoting a weight loss product or a what I eat in a day video, where it's like, oh, if I eat like that, if I exercise like that, I'm gonna be like them, I'm gonna look like them. And that has a really meaningful impact on how we view ourselves. Literature, if you've ever read a magazine or a book, that an article that impacts the way that you look at yourself or your view about yourself. School has a big one. Even just walking across campus, you may have compared yourself to someone else. You might just see the people who are walking across campus and that might impact your view of yourself. Sports or athletics, that's a big one as well, especially in specific sports. I grew up a dancer and there was this idea that you had to be thin in order to kick your leg higher or jump higher or leap farther. TV and film is a really big one as well. The actors and actresses that we see on our screens really impact what we know as acceptable for a society, whether that comes to gender, whether that comes to body shape and size, whether that comes to background, race, or ethnicity, that really impacts us. Um, I think that's all of them. Yeah, so great. This is an awesome list to just base where this appearance ideal is coming from. What does our culture tell us will happen if we reach the appearance ideal? This is an interesting question because we all chase it in some way or another, but for what reason? Why do we chase it? People will like you more. People will like you more. That human need for belonging, a part of something, a part of a group, family. Validation. Validation. Yes. Happiness. Happiness. You'll be happy if you're welcomed by a group of people, if you're the right body shape and size, do you look a certain way or dye your hair a certain color? Maybe success or money, career goals, to reach all of those things if you look the part. Yeah, all of these things happen and we reach for it for that specific reason. But do you think they actually do happen when we reach that appearance ideal? No. There's so often we're chasing that moving line again. And when we're chasing a moving line, that happiness gets farther and farther away each time we think we're gonna obtain it. Or that belonging, that sense of validation gets farther and farther away each time we're trying to chase it. What are some of the costs by trying to reach these appearance ideals? That's a very curious question. What have you spent your money on in order to obtain that happiness, that belonging, a sense of purpose through what we look like? Plastic surgery, good. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Wardrobe. Wardrobe. Makeup. Makeup. You start running at a receipt in your mind while you're saying all these things. You're like, oh. Time and friends and family. Time and friends and family, yeah. It doesn't have to be so much monetary costs, but also the intangible costs. Work, work, grades, grades, mental health. On the flip side, you could also be, instead of gaining happiness, losing happiness by trying to chase this appearance ideal. What about workout facilities? How many have a gym membership? How much have you spent on your gym membership? 
I actually work at a pure bar studio, so I, I understand how much those things cost. So all of these are costs of reaching the appearance ideal. And is it worth it? Is it really worth it? Who benefits from all these costs? When we're thinking about a gym membership, who's benefiting from you buying that gym membership? The people who sold it to you, so those fitness studios who are selling you those gym memberships, who are going to tell you that you can lose weight or you can be happier if you come to our facility and lose weight, which I completely disagree with from a fitness studio perspective, but that's, that's the case for a lot of gym memberships. And I walked into some of those gyms before and heard that from them. It also could be the makeup companies or the diet companies. So many of these companies are trying to sell you on things that are going to change your body shape and size, change what you look like, sell you on a sense of belonging and happiness. When you look at ads for, let's just say perfume, for, for example, when we're looking at a perfume ad, what do you see in those ads? Oftentimes they're a little bit sensual, a little bit saucy, and you're going to be sold on the sex of it. And that sense of belonging, being liked by someone else. So all of these ads, um, are trying to target a hurting point in you to try to tell you that you're not good enough as you are, you're not good enough in the skin that you're in to be able to sell you these products. And the funny thing is, the diet industry is a $70 billion industry that sets you up to fail. And it's not just the diet industry, it's also the beauty industry, it's also the fitness industry. All of these industries are trying to set you up to fail to keep coming back to them, so that you'll never reach that moving line of ideal, that appearance ideal, so you keep spending your money. Dieting also increases your likelihood of developing disordered eating or an eating disorder. This one still shocks me. The average person will try 126 bad diets in the course of their lifetime. That is more diets than you are alive in years. Isn't that so crazy? And there is also no research supporting evidence for long-term weight loss that is not considered disordered eating. So all of these things, as we're considering them, as we're talking about them, it's not to shame you. It's just to bring awareness to where we're putting our time and our energy and our money to try to shape and change who we are as people and what we look like. So let's evaluate our relationship with our body. Let's make a list of things. What can we do to combat this diet culture, this appearance ideal, the line that we keep on chasing and chasing and chasing, trying to find success? What kinds of things can we do? I have a list too, but I want to hear what you say before I put it up on the board. Don't label food good and bad. Don't label food good and bad. Make sure all foods are inclusive. Distancing from social media. Distancing from social media. Yeah. A social media feed is meant to feed your soul, is what I always tell everyone. And you don't have to follow people that you are constantly comparing yourself. I'm sure if you've unfollowed me, I would not be offended one bit because it's protecting your own mental health and your sanity. Great. Any others? Yeah, making sure you feel happy in your own skin. Do you have any specific ways that you do that for yourself? Excellent, yeah, great. Others? How about on my Zoom call? Anybody at home want to share? I was feeling your mom being talking here now. <laughs> no shame about that either. Well, I'll show you my list of things. Um, some of them have already been said, but start with accepting our own bodies. Accept the skin that we're in. Bodies change over the course of a lifetime. We're not going to be the same body that we're in when we're 12 years old and when we're 25 years old. Our body's also not going to be the same if we happen to carry a baby or 50 years from now, our body is definitely not going to be the same. You know, so stress has an impact on our bodies. Life has an impact on our bodies. So just accepting wherever you're at in the skin that you're in, in that current moment in time, will really be beneficial to finding that peace with your body. Compliment others internally rather than externally. It's so easy to compliment someone on their clothes. It's not a bad thing. You're still boosting their confidence, but wouldn't it be so much more impactful to say, you know what? Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. You made me feel so seen and heard, and I appreciate your energy throughout this entire course of the presentation. That's such more of a meaningful, impactful comment to comment on someone's internal um, 
internal physique rather than their external physique. Support companies that also fight against the appearance ideal. There's so many companies out there that are starting to change the norm of what a body should look like. There's a lot of actually athletic wear companies that are starting to change the norm. Athletics, Lululemon are starting to give all models a chance in all shapes and sizes of bodies and all backgrounds and ethnicities. And there's so many that are also in increasingly having disabled models in the industry as well, trying to create that body inclusivity for all, not just body shape and size, not just race, but also different abilities. It's also important just to change the conversation. If you hear someone talking about diet talk or having a conversation about, oh, I need to lose weight, I need to go to the gym later to work out to burn off what I ate, say, you know what? You're fine. You look great in the skin that you're in, and you're so much more than your body shape and size. Changing that conversation or just walking away because you have the power in the conversations to allow the conversations to change. Taking a stand in, against diet culture in whatever ways you can by not buying into products that you know are going to be harmful in the long run. Not engaging in comparison and uh, turning off that social media when you need to. Normalize just being you, being who you are in your own skin, finding the confidence to be yourself and be able to be yourself on any given day, even if it's not a great day. And here's the thing, I don't love my body every single day. And you definitely don't have to love your body every single day either. There's days I wake up and I'm like, you know what, this is it, this is what we got today, but I'm still gonna go out and live life. So just being acknowledging of your body and the abilities that it has to carry you through each and every day, no matter the circumstances, you still have that body and it's a vessel for you to do whatever work that you're on this earth to do. And then lastly, advocating for all bodies. That means diversifying your, your friend groups, making sure that you have friends who are of all backgrounds, of all abilities, of all body shapes and sizes, and advocating for bodies that are maybe not like yours to be able to, again, increase that community in all body shapes and sizes. All right. So that's the end of my presentation today. This is actually a photo of me on the Miss America stage. I'm very happy on that Miss America stage. But I did wanna give you a couple of information. So if you do wanna reach out with more questions, um, you can definitely reach out on any of my social media channels as well as my emails up there at the top. We do have a website for the Miss Washington Scholarship Organization if you're interested in competing. And this um, little scan QR code right here will actually take you directly to the registration page to learn more information about how you can get involved. If you are thinking about competing or just want some more interest, the Miss Seattle Scholarship Competition is happening on February 26th. So it's pretty close to you all here. Um, and it's happening over in Bellevue. So if you want to grab a group of friends and go over there and watch, um, you can definitely do that and just see what it's all about. Like I said, I've gained so many immeasurable skills through this organization as well as a lot of scholarship dollars. And I know we're all in college and college is expensive. So if you do want to give it a try, that's an excellent way to just check it out and see what it's about. And lastly, I want to answer any questions that you might have for me, if you have any. Um, otherwise, we can wrap it up for the day, but I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Just leave the floor open for you. If someone is making comments about food or their body image that's making you uncomfortable or someone that you can't really distance yourself from, what would you recommend you say to them to ask them to stop that? I would really encourage you to set boundaries. I'm going to repeat that question so my friends on Zoom can also hear me. Um, so we had a question about if someone that you know that you're really close with that you can't really distance yourself from is making comments about food, about body that are negatively impacting you, what should you say to that person? Um, so I would first start with setting boundaries with that person. And sometimes it's really hard to do, especially if you're close to that person, to have that hard conversation with them. To say, hey, this is not benefiting me. It's actually kind of harmful. So if you would just be cognizant of what you're saying around me um, and really try to educate them on the impact that it can have. So it's definitely not an easy conversation to have, especially if it's someone close to you. But I think that same conversation could be had if, um, say, you just went through a horrible breakup and your friend is talking about how much they love their new partner and how much they're like doing all these fun things. And you're like, I just went through this really hard breakup in my life and I don't want to talk about this and I don't want to hear about it. You would still say, hey, that's not beneficial to me right now because I need space to heal, right? So having that boundary set around food and body image is really, really important. And you can also start that conversation to help them change their mindset about food and body. Thank you. Awesome question. 
Any other questions for me? Yeah. What can we do for people around us that we might not necessarily know that they have a serious care? Because a lot of times we don't know, like, and if they have something that we say or like how to bring to the Yeah, great question. For my friends at home, they said, uh, or she said that there might be a situation where you don't know if someone's struggling with an eating disorder. And so how can we change the conversations from um, saying something negative about our bodies that might be triggering to them if we don't know? And my best advice to give to you is just don't say it. If it might be triggering, just try not to say it at all. And um, so if we're trying to create, again, change those conversations around body image about our own bodies, uh, just really trying to take initiative and say positive things about our bodies, create more inclusive conversations around bodies, around food, X, Y, and Z. Um, that way that we're not saying anything that could potentially be triggering, triggering for someone. Any other questions? Yeah. What's the best way you can support? So if you have like a friend who's going through a potential eating disorder, what's the best way you can support them? Like words wise, if you could like, I don't know, like the types of conversations people usually are willing to have, but um, even just providing emotional support, how would you go about that? The question was, I'm sure you're right next to the screen, but I'll say it again. <laughs> Um, so the question was, if someone you know is going through the recovery process from an eating disorder and you want to help them and help them officially um, on their recovery journey as well, what kinds of things should you say or to emotionally support them? What should you do? And my biggest advice is that everyone is different <laughs> along their journey. And some people need different things than others. Some people don't want to talk about it and they only want to talk about it to their treatment team or their therapist or their dietitian. And so in that case, just be a normal friend to them, hang out with them. Um, if they do want support at a meal, maybe like plan a meal that they're able to go out to brunch with you on a Saturday and be that meal support for them. But otherwise, ask them what they need. If they have confided in you and said, hey, I'm in treatment right now. Um, I just want to be able to hang out with you and have support. Ask them, is there anything that I can do for you? And maybe they don't know their needs in that moment. But as they get stronger through the recovery process, they might be able to voice those a little bit better. Um, and you'll be able to support them in those ways. Sometimes it's just, I, I need someone to vent to every so often. Sometimes it is, I wanna go get brunch or go get lunch with you sometimes. Um, and sometimes it might just be, I need to sit in silence right now and watch this movie, <laughs> you know? So just ask them what they need. Um, and a lot of times they'll be able to voice that at some point in their recovery. Great. Well, if there are no other questions for me, we can wrap up there. Thank you everyone for coming out today and thanks at home for listening in. I hope you were able to take something away from this conversation and maybe start to turn those gears in your brain away from diet culture, away from negative body talk to help promote more inclusivity in body shapes and sizes. Again, I'm going to leave that contact information up on the screen if you want to reach out to me or if there's a question that you didn't want to ask in a general public assembly room. So feel free to contact me in any of those ways as well. All right. Well, have a good one, y'all.